Hi all, so in this video we are going to see about examination of cranial nerve 7 and this video is especially for those first year MBBS students who are going to appear for their clinical practical examination. So we know that cranial nerves are 12 in number. We have already discussed how to examine cranial nerves number 1 to 6. So this is the next cranial nerve which is cranial nerve 7 that is facial nerve. So as we know facial nerve is a mixed nerve having sensory and motor components. So we have to test both sensory and motor. So the sensory part of facial nerve is mainly via the cauda tympani branch and it is, it is responsible for the taste sensation of the anterior two third of the tongue. So we will see how to test the taste sensation there. So for that we first of all we have to test each half separately because we want to know which, which uh, facial nerve is affected whether right or left. So we have to test each part separately and use strong solutions of sugar or salt. And one more important thing is we ask the subject to close their eyes and protrude their tongue. So once they close their eyes and protrude their tongue we apply the solution on the protruded tongue. Remember we have to do it only on one half of the tongue. And then we ask the subject to write down or indicate the taste they perceive before withdrawing the tongue. Now this is an important point. If they take in the tongue to know the taste, then the taste receptors that is present on the buccal mucosa or other taste receptors will also be activated. So we don't want that. We just want to test the anterior two-third of the tongue which carries uh, the of which the facial nerve carries a taste sensation so without withdrawing the tongue the person must indicate what the taste is which means he will not be able to speak during that time so it is always good if you can take a piece of paper and uh, draw a column and mark it as sugar and salt so that will be easier for the subject to indicate what the taste is many students often forget this step and will allow the patient to take in the tongue and say the taste that they felt. So remember for taste sensation always make a paper ready or at least give them a clue. If it is sugar raise your hands or if it is salt raise two fingers whatever. Give them the instruction that they are not supposed to take in the tongue before the test is over. Okay, And uh, you have to test both the sides both right and left. So and after testing one solution so suppose on one side you put sugar solution after that the person must ideally wash the mouth and only then you must test on the other side okay because we don't want the taste to get intermingled so the after before testing different solutions the person must rinse the mouth and then come back so this is how ideally you have to test the taste sensation for facial nerve next moving on to the motor part so the motor part of facial nerve is basically the muscles of facial expression. Now I would like to clarify one thing here. Remember trigeminal nerve is for muscles of mastication. Facial nerve is for muscles of facial expression. I find most students get confused with this point. Trigeminal muscles of mastication. Facial nerve muscles of facial expression. Okay. So the different muscles that we are going to examine here are anterior belly of occipital frontalis orbicularis oculi, orbicularis oris, vaccinator, levator angular oris, depressor angular oris, platys mild, stapedius. So these are some of the muscles that are uh, uh, that are innervated by the facial nerve. So we will see how to test each one of them. So first we can test the anterior belly of occipital frontalis. So to test this muscle you can ask the subject to raise the eyebrows and wrinkle their forehead. So before each test you can actually demonstrate the test to the patient so that or subject so that he will be more familiar with what to do. If you just give an instruction as to raise the eyebrows most of the time the subject will just look up without wrinkling their forehead. So you first demonstrate what is to be done and then as a subject to raise the eyebrows. So the thing will be more cl uh, clarified for the subject. Okay so here you can ask the subject to raise the eyebrows and wrinkle the forehead. So as you can see there will be wrinkles formed and you are actually testing if they are almost equal or not. So once you test this, you can actually report to the examiner that the anterior belly of oxygen frontalis is normal. Just don't say that uh, wrinkling is normal on both sides. You can also mention which muscle you tested. So that will be more good. Next, uh, okay, so as I said, you have to compare the wrinkles on both sides. Not only that, if it's absent on one side, it can indicate that there is a facial nerve lesion. So that is why we are comparing the wrinkles on both sides. The next muscle that we are going to check is the orbicularis oculi. So for that you know orbicularis oculi is a muscle which surrounds the eye. 
so for this you can ask the subject to shut their eyes tightly and we try to open them against the subject's resistance okay so if you can open one very easily it means there is a paralysis of orbicularis oculi so this is how you can test that muscle so here also when you report to the examiner try to mention the muscle that you have tested next is the levator anguli oris so for that you can ask the subject to smile showing their teeth okay in fact we are actually uh, assessing zygomaticus major also but mainly the angle of mouth which is a, which is supplied by the levator anguli oris so here what we do is we check if there is any deviation of this angle of mouth now if there is a deviation that means if one side is not uh, working or if one one part of the mus one side of the muscle is not working what will happen we'll feel that only the that the smile is deviated to one side which means there is a facial uh, lesion so we'll say we'll be saying more about this angle of deviation in the later slides so uh, right now i uh, know that we have to ask the subject to smile showing their teeth and we look for the angle of mouth the next muscle that we are going to check is a buccinator so for that you can ask the subject to inflate both the cheeks and then we gently tap on the cheeks and see if there is any escape of air so if air is escaping easily it means there is a lesion on one side okay and next we have to check their nasolabial folds so as you can see in this picture this is a normal one b is a normal one while a is a person with facial palsy so as you can see this is the labial nasolabial fold okay you can see that for the normal person both the naso nasolabial folds are prominent but if there is a facial nerve lesion what will happen that this that part of the nasolabial fold will not be prominent okay so that is how you compare the nasolabial fold so less prominence means that there is a lesion next we have orbicularis oris for that you can ask the subject to whistle or at least do uh, do a movement as if sipping from a straw and if the person is unable to do it it can indicate that there is a muscle weakness and finally platysma so to test for platysma you can ask the subject to grimace what do you mean by grimace so for that you can give the instruction to clench the teeth and attempt to depress the corners of the mouth okay so uh, so before doing this actually you can demonstrate of how to do this uh test so that the subject will understand what you want them to do okay so when when you clench the teeth and depress the corners of the mouth the platysma muscle will become more prominent you can see the folds of the platysma it looks somewhat like this okay so you can it will be more visible when the platysma contracts so that is how you have to test for platysma and finally you can uh, test for stapedia so for that you can ask the subject if they experience any hyperacusis hyperacusis means hearing noises that are loud louder than normal like for example hearing hearing the sound of someone chewing or swallowing or some clicking all other sounds will appear very loud to them so that is meant by hyperacusis you can ask the subject if they experience that and if it is if hyperacusis there it can indicate a paralysis of the stapedius muscle okay so to uh, summarize for motor functions of facial nerve you have to uh, do the following as a subject to wrinkle the forehead close the eyes smile inflating cheeks nasolabial fold whistling clenching teeth and grimacing and hyperacusis so you can study this with a mnemonic or at least remember that you have eight things to do for motor functions of facial nerve you have you have to do at least eight things for motor uh, functions of facial nerve okay you also have to complete it with doing the reflexes because remember for reflexes you've got an afferent and an efferent pathway so for these reflexes that is corneal and conjunctival pathway the efferent is through the facial nerve because there is closure of eyes so that is why the test will be complete only after examination of the corneal and conjunctival reflexes i have explained how to do that in the previous videos you can go check it if you don't remember basically you just touch the wisp of cotton Uh, on the cornea uh, on the uh, conjunctiva and the limbus there are some fine points to remember you can go check that video okay so that will complete examination of facial nerve now at this point we have to know some theory also based on facial nerve so i'll just try to explain that look at these two photographs and tell me what difference is there between the two obviously you can see that both have a facial nerve lesion but there's a difference what is the difference you can see that in the second picture there are no wrinkles on this part of the forehead on the upper part there are no wrinkles on one side 
so what what does that mean so here as you can see both of them have got a lesion on this side right which means on their right side both of both them both of them have a lesion that is why the angle of dv angle is deviated to the opposite side see the muscles here are normal but here it is affected that is why this uh, this part of the mouth or angle of mouth is not move, moved there so the lesion is on the right side but there is a difference for one person there is wrinkles on both sides for one person there is wrinkles only on the normal side not on the abnormal side so what is this so see the first person actually had a upper motor neuron lesion or a supranuclear lesion which means he's got a lesion above the facial nerve nucleus so in this case it affects mainly the lower part of the face or the upper part of the face is bad due to bilateral innervation what bilateral innervation is we'll see so remember in upper motor neuron lesion upper part of face is bad okay so what about this in this case the whole face is affected whole right side of the face is affected which means this is a lower motor neuron lesion or an infranuclear lesion that means the lesion is below the level of the facial nerve at the level or below the level of the facial nerve in this case both upper and lower part of the face is affected now one important sign we should know here is a bell sign in element facial palsy there is something called the bell sign that is when the person tries to close the eyes there'll be up rolling of the eyeball okay on the affected part there'll be up rolling of the eyeball so that is known as bell sign so now i'll try to explain what this upper and motor neuron lesion is so as you can see this is the cortex and this is the pons and you've got the facial nerve nucleus inside the pons so this is the face so usually for upper part of the face we've got bilateral representation which means you have uh, innervation from both the sides reaching the upper part of the face okay whereas the lower part of the face has got innervation only from one side as you can see it is only from the contralateral hemisphere that you've got the innervation to the lower part of the face so suppose there is a upper motor neuron lesion what will happen as you can see the lower part of the face will obviously be affected because it has got just one innervation but what about the upper part of the face see even though the fibers from that part which is affected will be uh, effect uh, will be affected there is this other pathway here okay because of this bilateral representation the upper part of the face will be spared okay which means in human facial palsy only the lower part of the face will be affected the upper part will be spared that is because of the bilateral representation of the upper part okay so what about lower motor neuron lesion in lower motor neuron neuron lesion obviously because it is that final pathway that is being affected both upper and lower will be affected which means the patient's whole face will be affected in element facial palsy okay so this concept should be uh, clear because this is quite important if your question is facial nerve examination then most probably the examiner will ask you about element and uh, human lesion your uh, element and human facial palsy because this is quite common okay so try to understand this concept you'll learn more about this in medicine because there are many finer points to all this i'm just giving a summary so that you'll have some idea of what human element lesion is so to summarize we first tested for the sensory functions we tested for the taste on the anterior two thirds and for motor functions we tested all the muscles of facial expression so i hope this video is uh, useful for you the rest of the cranium nerves will be uh, shown in the next video okay thank you